So Luke Smith made a really good video talking about how he doesn't understand why people use things like snaps and flat packs and how they produce more problems than they actually solve. And in this video, he mentioned a website called Flat Kill. Now, he went over some of the arguments on this website, but he kind of skipped over some of them altogether. So I thought, why don't I go have a look at this for myself and see what the author has to say? Because most of the arguments are pretty good. However, there are some very obvious mistakes that have been made. So this is the 2018 version that we're looking at, but I will be looking at the 2020 version in just a bit. The reason why we're looking at this one, though, is because a lot of the arguments being made are still completely valid even today. So the first point being made is about the sandbox. So almost all popular applications on FlatHub come with file system equals host, file system equals home, or device equals all permissions, and that is basically write permission to the user's home directory. This effectively means that all it takes to escape the sandbox is basically echoing to your bash RC, so you could echo some sort of malicious code, you could echo some sort of function that does any sort of number of things. Now, there is one mistake being made here, so let's actually go over what these permissions actually mean. So, file system equals home, uh, we'll just search for home, we should be able to find it. File system equals home means access to the user's home directory and then any subfolders of that. Let's go to host. Host basically means access to most of the system except for these blacklist folders. So your lib, bin, sbin, user, things like that. So things that applications generally don't need to have access to at all. There is a exception for that with the run folder with run slash media because this is where removable media is typically mounted to. And there's also an exception for folders mounted under this point as well. Now the mistake that was made was with device equals all because those first ones, they definitely do give you access to your home directory. Device equals all, however, doesn't. And I don't know why that was included. It's a bit of a weird inclusion. So device equals all basically gives you access to all controllers, all webcams, basically all devices plugged into the system. So no, this is not right access to your home directory. Anything that just includes this doesn't have access to your home directory, but the others are definitely fair points. Now, should most applications have right access to these devices? Absolutely not. That is a fair point to make, but it isn't right access to your home. And I'll take the applications listed here as ones with permissions issues at face value because I haven't checked these for myself, but GIMP, VS Code, PyCharm, Octave, Inkscape, Steam, Audacity, VLC, and a bunch of others come with one or all of these permissions errors. And then as it says here, users are misled to believe that their apps are running in a sandbox mode basically by showing a little sandbox icon. And I completely agree, if you have right access to your home directory, that is obviously not a sandbox. Now this next point about security updates is slightly disingenuous, it's not completely wrong, but it's saying that running a flat pack is about as much of a security error as running something like Ubuntu. So basically what it says here is that four months ago there was an error called CVE 2018 11235 that existed in Git. Basically, this is a arbitrary code execution vulnerability, and something like that is a pretty serious problem. And basically, the Flatpak version of VS Code, Android Studio, and Sublime Text was still shipping with an unpatched version of Git. So basically, they still had that vulnerability in them. And the version of PyCharm, it does come with a newer version. However, that one actually came with a different vulnerability that basically allowed you to do the exact same thing. So another arbitrary code execution vulnerability. Now, the issue I have with saying this is a flat pack problem is because this very much depends on the developers. Obviously, these are very, very popular applications and they should be getting updated much more frequently than this but some applications do actually receive parallel updates for the flat pack, the snap, and the regular version. But the issue here is that this is the exact same problem that distros have as well. So let's say you have something like, I don't know, Arch Linux, and you have Ubuntu. So Arch Linux is going to have applications that are much newer than the ones that are available in the Ubuntu repos. So if there is a security vulnerability in the version that is on Ubuntu, Ubuntu now has a major security vulnerability that doesn't exist on Arch Linux. This isn't a flat pack problem per se, this is a problem with segmentation. Anywhere there is segmentation, there is going to be some problem with actually getting updates to each of the systems. Obviously, adding more segmentation does make the problem worse though, so I guess you can make the argument from that respect. The next point we have is about the Flatpak team not addressing their priorities in a reasonable order. So there existed a local root exploit and 
they consider this to be a minor issue. So a local root exploit basically means there was a way to gain root access on your host system. So up until 0.8.7, all it took to get root on the host was to install a Flatpak package that contains an SUID binary. Flatpaks are installed to slash var slash lib slash Flatpak on your host system. Again, could this be any easier? A high severity CVE 2017 9780 with a CVSS score of 7.2, which is a pretty high score, was basically filed saying this is a serious problem with Flatpaks. And the Flatpak developers basically patched this within a minor security patch rather than patching it as something really major that needed to be dealt with. So all that ultimately matters in this case is the fact that the vulnerability did get patched. However, it does show that at least in this case, the Flatpak team didn't really consider security to be a serious thing to deal with. And to end off this article, the author says, Future of application distribution, let's hope not. Sadly, it's obvious Red Hat developers working on a flat pack do not care about security, yet the self-proclaimed goal is to replace desktop application distribution, a cornerstone of Linux security. This local root exploit is a valid complaint to bring up. However, the problem about patches is on the developer side and already existed between various distros, so I don't think it's really a valid point to bring up. A point that is valid though is about desktop integration because in 2018 basic things like font size wouldn't be passed on to the flat pack and there was also problems with FCITX if you wanted to do IME integration for doing things like Chinese, Korean or Japanese characters. There is a fix for it however the fix isn't really a sensible fix. So let's go over to the 2020 version and see what's actually changed. So as the author says here, the sandbox is still a lie and luckily they realized that between 2018 and now they actually had an extra permission on this list that shouldn't have been here. So now that's actually gone, but the security vulnerability still does exist and it still exists in the exact same applications and there's still no icon that says this application isn't actually sandboxed if it has access to your entire file system. And unsurprisingly, in 2020, developers are still very lazy because there are still problems with the various distribution methods for their applications. But as with 2018, the problem still exists between various distros. Now, the issue we have listed here is CVE 2019 at 17498. However, this issue doesn't actually exist in the CVE database, but it does exist over on a GitHub post. So let's go and have a look at that one. Basically, what this is is an out-of-bounds read error, which in other terms is basically just a buffer overflow to read memory that you shouldn't have access to. So that's a pretty serious problem and should be patched as quickly as possible. And this issue existed in a library called libssh2 and an application called gitg was shipping with an unpatched version of this. But as I said a bunch of times, this is a developer problem, not a problem with flat packs. I would say a legitimate concern to bring up though is an exploit that exists in the Flatpak runtimes because these are the runtimes that every single person using Flatpaks is going to be using. And there was this issue here called CVE 2020 12284. However, I can't tell you anything about this vulnerability because it doesn't exist in the CVE database. So I don't know if the author is trying to mislead people or if they just included an incorrect link or something like that. I can't really say anything about this exploit, but any exploits that do exist in the main runtimes are serious problems. But we also have a point here that talks about why updating bundled libraries is kind of difficult, and this is by the founder of the Flatpak project. Another problem is with security or bug fix updates in bundled libraries. With bundled libraries, it's much harder to upgrade a single library as you need to find and upgrade each app that uses it. Better tooling and upgraded support can lessen the impact of this, but not completely eliminate it. So maybe there is some problem that fundamentally exists with the bundled library method. And luckily in 2020, the developers now consider local root exploits to be a serious vulnerability that needs to be addressed in just as serious of a way as we can see in this GitHub post right here. So if you want to go and read through that, I'm not going to do so here because I feel like that's uh, kind of boring to do. And lastly, when it comes to desktop integration, things have gotten at least a little bit better, but there's still plenty of issues to deal with. So system and user fonts are now available to Flatpak applications and basic font rendering settings are respected as well. So at least there's something there, but there's still a lot of problems in regards to doing theming. And with the FCITX problem that existed two years ago, it wasn't actually broken, but it's designed in such a bad way that anyone would assume this is not going to work. So 
Basically, the developer for FCITX contacted the author for this and said, because FCITX I'm module in Flatpak is from 4.2.97 and using a different Dbus object path, it needs to be the same version of FCITX on your host. So if you want to use FCITX in a flat pack, you'd have to run it in two different locations, which is a really weird thing to do, and obviously is gonna seem broken. So most of the points brought up in these two blog posts were completely valid, and when they weren't, it's always good to call out developers who haven't fixed their problems to fix the problems as soon as possible, because there's a lot of people out there who, if they can get away with being lazy, are gonna get away with being lazy. Now, as I've said a bunch of times, I don't actually care what you run. If you want to run flat packs, if you want to run snaps, if you want to run app images, it's your system. Do what you want to do with it. Now that you have this information, you can decide whether you want to continue using flat packs and accept the problems that you might have, or whether you want to stop using them altogether and just, I don't know, come up with some other solution, whether that be compile all the applications yourself or just any of the other solutions that do exist. So I think that's pretty much everything for the main video. But before I go, I just wanted to say that towards the end of Luke's video, he congratulated me on hitting 10K subs. I just want to say thank you for that because I would not have hit 10K anywhere near as quickly if it wasn't for that shout out when my videos were absolute garbage. Now on that note, Luke also said that my lighting and my camera looked really good. Now obviously the lighting I've done a bit of work to, it's not amazing, but it, it's a bit of work. Also though, the camera I'm using is the same camera that you have. Your camera can look like this. The reason why it doesn't is because you're running in FFmpeg. And as we can see here, you're also running it in 4x3. And when you run a C920 in 4x3, you can't run it in 1080p. Also, I've got a LUT enabled and there's no standalone software that actually let you enable a LUT. So just accept some bloat and use OBS because it will look much, much better. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Donald, Joachim, Kilbinian, Andrew, Craig, Nathan, Monsada, Chico, Bento, Joseph, Peter, D, Road, Tony, Brennan, John, Marek, Mikkel, Nate, Dog, Nephite, Poe, Tees, and Zilva. If you want to go and support my work, there'll be links down below to my Patreon, leave a pay, subscribe star, and then maybe one day I will buy a better camera that actually will look good. I've also got my podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere you can listen to podcasts and this channel is available on Library, Odyssey and BitChute if you want to watch it somewhere that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me and I'm out.